You know, I think the biggest myth is that people think that every person that's diagnosed with cancer automatically loses their hair. Mm. And I also think that people think just because you go through cancer treatment and you don't lose your hair, that your cancer isn't as viable as the person that did lose their hair. It's just a matter of a treatment. You know, when I um, was diagnosed with cancer three years ago, um, mine was just simply taken care of by a surgery. Thank goodness I didn't have to go through chemo or radiation, but it doesn't make me any less um, fearful. It doesn't make, it didn't make my cancer any less viable because I didn't have to go through that. I still heard the words you have cancer. And so I think mm. that people automatically think we hear the word cancer. It's a death sentence. I'm going to lose my hair. That's all there is to it. And that's not it. Cancer isn't a death sentence anymore. And every treatment doesn't make you lose your hair. And so I think that those are the two things that, that people just don't get. And, and so that being said, if you've ever heard the words you have cancer, if you have a family member, just be compassionate no matter what it is they're going through, because there's still mental duress to the fact that you heard those words. Hey everyone, this is Devin Miller here with another episode of The Inventive Expert. I'm your host, Devin Miller, the serial entrepreneur that's grown several startups into seven and eight figure businesses, as well as the founder and CEO of Miller IP Law, where he helps startups and small businesses with their patents and trademarks. If you ever need help with yours, just go to strategymeeting.com, grab some time with us to chat, and we're always here to help. Now, today we've got another great guest on the podcast, Kim Becker. And uh, Kim, we're going to be talking a lot about uh, nonprofits. And so it um, doesn't mean that they can't be profitable. And that's part of our discussion. And uh, so we're going to be talking a little bit about sometimes going from a uh, from a profit to a nonprofit and what that entails and kind of what the differences are. Uh, maybe also talking a little bit about how to start up a non nonprofit and if you should or when you should, um, dealing with the IRS and, uh, and how you might have to go about doing that. Um, and the benefits of either starting up your own nonprofit or maybe just partnering with a nonprofit uh, if you're a for-profit business. And uh, if you are a nonprofit, how to make it profitable, um, which is, you know, kind of funny that, uh, you know, everybody, you have to still make a profitable business, even if it's not profitable or if it's a nonprofit um, and uh, and I'll probably a whole bunch of other uh, great discussions. So with that much as an introduction, welcome on the podcast, Kim. Oh my gosh, Devin, thank you so much for having me and actually for having me back. So I'm excited to be here. Absolutely excited to have you on. So so with that, you know, but now before we dive into uh, to the kind of topics at hand, you know, as a quick reminder to the audience, so Kim was on our sister podcast, The Inventive Journey. So if you want to go and hear her journey there, definitely invite you to go do so. And it's a, a great journey to, to catch up on. But for those people who are saying, hey, I haven't had a chance to, to catch up on it or a gay, I just want the third or the, you know, the quick version of it uh, before we dive into the topics at hand, go ahead and uh, introduce yourself to the audience. So, um, as Devin said, my name is Kim Becker, and I am the founder of a nonprofit called Hello Gorgeous. Um, but I started out as a hairdresser. I was a hairdresser for 30 years, owned a salon for 10 years, and then we uh, sold the salon and started the nonprofit. Um, it has been a roller coaster of a journey, to say the least. Um, and about five years ago, I actually went um, from having a partner in this uh, to losing my husband. And so we have actually been, we've been trailblazing all the way, but then it, another bump in the road when we lost him. And so um, to say that we've been a nonprofit in existence for 16 years, five of which without one of our co-founders is quite the feat. So I'm excited mm. to be here to share my story and um, answer your questions with the hopes that it'll help somebody else on their journey, you know, because we had to learn the hard way, but I don't know if that it was all hard, but it's just asking questions and talking to people that have already done some of the things that we wanted to do. And that was really helpful. No, that uh, that's definitely a great uh, intro and then certainly helpful. So now with that, you know, one of the things that in no particular, but I think one of the things that we talked a little bit about is going from a profit or for-profit business to a nonprofit. And I think a lot of people don't know what a nonprofit is or what the difference is. In other words, they, they know that there's a difference. Usually nonprofits are charitable organizations. There's a bit more tax implications or overtones in that. But most people beyond that are thinking, well, they must not make a profit or they don't you know, generate income or it's a charity or those type of things. But help kind of maybe just as a kind of a, a level set, help people understand what is the difference between a for-profit business and a nonprofit? So we are a 501c3 charity listed with the IRS. Basically, what means is that we don't 
We don't pay taxes on certain things. And all of the money that we make in the organization just goes back to the organization. So we don't pay shareholders. We don't pay stockholders. Everything that we earn just goes back into that. Now, I had a challenge in the beginning, even as a nonprofit leader, you know, it's so deceiving when it says nonprofit, because mm -hmm. automatically in your mind, it means, well, I can't make a profit. No, that just means that my profits go back into the organization. I can make as much money as I want. And really what happens is, is the more money I make, the more people I get to help, which is what I need to, to do. And I, you know, I always said somebody had said once a long time ago, and I wish that we would have adopted that instead of calling it a nonprofit organization, they should call it a for purpose organization. Um, mm. You know, I was challenged once and they said that every Fortune 500 company should run their company the same way that they ask a nonprofit to run their company. Um, you know, one of the biggest things is people look at how much money goes towards the mission and how much money goes towards the administrative costs. And mm. so people don't want it to go to high salaries and that kind of thing, but yet they want quality people in those positions, you know, in order to be able to do that. So we're really fortunate. We've been able to kind of keep ours at 70, 30. So 70 cents on every dollar goes towards the mission and 30 cents on every dollar goes towards the nonprofit organization. So when you're looking at like GuideStar and Charity Navigator and those kind of things, those are the things that are people are looking at when they actually go to look and find an, a nonprofit organization that they'd like to support. Mm, no, it uh, makes perfect sense. So now I'm going to follow up, which is a question I've always wondered. And I, some of these, I have an inclination as the answer, but I always I'd love to hear the, you know, get a, someone that does it more in and out. So let's say I wanted to start any given business. And, you know, one of the benefits of a nonprofit is you can have some re reduce or light or burden on the, the taxes. In other words, you don't have to pay as many taxes and the tax structure is a bit different. So why wouldn't you just go and take a for-profit business and say, hey, rather than, especially if it's a privately run business, rather than go out and, you know, or, or why, why not just set it up as a nonprofit? In other words, hey, I'm going to go out and make a for-profit business to operate it exactly the same. And the only difference is, is rather than paying, you know, dividends at the end or paying some of that, I'll just give myself a really big salary and then I don't have to pay as much taxes. So is it as simple as that? Because I know you've had to, I know that you have to figure things out with the IRS and they scrutinize it. So is it as simple as just, hey, I'm not going to pay dividends or bonuses at the end and I'll just pay myself a big salary and then reinvest all the money? Would that be a good candidate for a nonprofit or is there more to it? There's more to it, but also it's just what I had stated earlier as far as people are looking at the amount of money that's going to administrative costs and to the nonprofit. So many times when you have a for-profit business, right? If the, the CEO decides that he wants to pay himself a million dollars, right? Mm. And he's only bringing in a million five, you know, then that's kind of upside down with the scale. So more money is going to administrative than it would be to the actual mission. And so I think that there's some, um, there's some differences there as far as when you're dealing with taxes, you know, there's, and there's more accountability to the IRS as well. As well. There's more paperwork and different things that you have to, to fill out, but it's not, you have to show your mission. So mm. whether it's that, you know, you can't just go and say that you're going to make rubber mallets, you know, you have to show, all right, by making the rubber mallet, what is that going to do? It's not as simple as just manufacturing something. It's actually, you're providing that rubber mallet to people in Africa who are going to be able to use that to, you know, build buildings. And so what does that breakdown look like? How much is actually going into the mallet? How much is going into shipping? How much is going into the the cost of the people that are making the mallets, you know, those kind of things. And so, no, it is, it is different. And the other thing is too, you know, for us, and that what I had noticed was the difference between when I ran a for-profit business for 10 years and then started the nonprofit, you know, there were things that I could do to generate income, right? So there were things that I could take on a haircut. I could throw some extra highlights in. I could run a retail sale. I could say, mm -hmm. Kim's having a bad mood. We're just going to run the retail, you know, 20% off sale, whatever it is. When you run a nonprofit, I mean, we've got a few things that we can sell, but we really have to base ourselves and, and the money that we bring in on the generosity of others. And I have no control over that. I can't reach into people's pockets and say, I need you to give money. I can pull on their heartstrings, but it's still, unless they're motivated, unless they actually want to move to donate money, you know, I, I'm kind of at the mercy of the public that believe in who I am and the mission that I have. No, that makes uh, perfect sense. And, you know, so it sounds like for you to 
if I were to simplify it down to the level of understanding, which has to be pretty simple uh, to, um, as far as I understand, kind of if I were to look at it, if I'm doing it prof or for profit or nonprofit, one is you have to have a mission and that mission can't just be make myself rich or make lots of money, but you have to actually say, hey, here's the cause that we're going to do or the, you know, the, the mission that we're, the company is going to be. And then you also have to look at, you know, are we going to meet some of the tax ramifications and do you want it to set it up in other words do you want it to be you can't pay yourself a bonus you have to you can't have dividends you most of the time you can't have a lot of investors or go out and you know have their angel investors of venture capital because they're all going to want to have equity and and some of those things so and then the kind of the follow-up to that is the thing that you'd hit on is and you, you started to touch on it which is so now you know there is a difference because i think some people go into a, and maybe there's not a difference, you can tell me if they, you know, go from a for-profit business and go into a nonprofit and are going to run or try and run them the exact same. Is there, is that, are you able to, do you run the nonprofit the exact same as a, a for-profit business other than or the filings with the IRS or what are some of the differences and what should you be considering when you're, if you're to look to make that transition? I actually think that that is one of the things that I did wrong in the beginning was I didn't run my nonprofit organization like a business. And so I think that that is really what people need to do that start a nonprofit is you need to run it like a business. There's still a P&L statement, you know, there's still expenses, there's still all of those things. And so, and, and again, right, you have to create income, you have to generate income, you just generate it differently. And so I think in the beginning, because of the fact that I was a nonprofit, I looked to um, downgrade a little bit as far as the work that I did or the services that I provided. And that's where I was in the wrong, because it really does need to be run like a business in order to be sustainable. And like I said, you know what? I'm really fortunate because we've been in this for 16 years. There are a lot of nonprofits that haven't, that didn't make it that far. And we survived a pandemic, you know, through this, like we had to go, we went from in-person doing what we were doing and we had to pivot to do virtual makeovers that we were doing. And so again, I think it's even the businesses, right? Those that pivoted through the pandemic are the ones that are still here and still viable. And so, no, I think that that is a mistake that many nonprofits make is that they don't run it like a business. And that's exactly what you need to do is you need to run it like a business. Mm. So, okay. So now we've got, or we've got that after, you know, have to have a mission, have to have a cause. Otherwise you shouldn't really be running it like business. And that's you know, when I've talked with a lot of other startups and small businesses, especially they're in the nonprofit. I think that those are the ones that are successful. I think too many people go in and say, well, have a great cause. And then people will just, you know, out of the goodness of their heart, they're going to donate from the charity and it will work out great because everybody wants to give all of their money away to charities, which not everybody or most people don't want to give all their money. There's some people that are really charitable, uh, but I think you have to look at and say, okay, now how do you make it a, a profitable or sustainable business now? Right. One of the things that we talked with uh, and I or talked with before, and I know that you guys are, are came across or had to deal with early on in the the in the nonprofit was dealing with the IRS. And so maybe give people an insight kind of what are the things that you have, you know, that you may have to deal with the IRS when you're doing a nonprofit and kind of how do you go about dealing with it and how did you guys do it? Well, so you do have to deal with the IRS, whether you like it or not, because <laughs> they're the ones that kind of give you the stamp of approval. Um, and you know what? We were dumb. We didn't know what we were doing. Um, and I always say that you know, I don't have to reinvent the wheel. I just need to find somebody else who's doing what I want to do and then model after them. So after talking with a lot of people that had started nonprofits, I, you know, and finding out guidance, because like I needed somebody to hold my hand. Uh, it wasn't just a matter of somebody just saying, here, go do this. We needed somebody to actually hold our hand and walk us through the process. So mm -hmm. we found that SCORE was wonderful. So SCORE is a nonprofit organization of retired business people, and they'll help you with whatever you want. They'll help you write a business plan for a profit business. And for us, it was really great because they helped us with our nonprofit. And so we told them what we wanted to do and how we went about it. And so, you know, when you fill out your 501c3 paperwork, it's, there's a bunch of information that you have to give to the IRS, but then they also want a business plan. And so we sat down and, you know, we got all of that together. And so then we got questions back from the IRS. So we took it back to the gentleman at SCORE and said, okay, now what? And what we did, which was really helpful, is that you know when they asked a question, it was one question per sheet. <laughs> so it was one question and then that answer to whatever that question was that they had had. And we did that on several. 
Um, and so that was really helpful. SCORE was amazing. And actually, I tell anybody that's getting ready to start a business to visit your local SCORE chapter because it's free of charge. And these guys love it. Like they want to see you successful. So that was the first thing that we did. The second thing is, as the story goes, is that we were starting our nonprofit at the same time that Katrina hit. So mm. everybody and their brother was trying to start a nonprofit organization because everybody wanted to help the victims of Katrina. And so we were in this place for like, OK, great. So I remember being on with this gentleman from the IRS and, you know, I'm all fired up about being able to help these women with cancer. And I said, OK, like, when can I expect to get this approval? When? And he's like, it's going to take two years. And I'm like, I don't have two years. Remember being diagnosed with cancer every single day. I got to get out mm. there. I need this approval. I've got to be able to do this. And he said, we are so infiltrated right now with new applications. You, there's no way that you're going to be able to get this before two years. So I was venting my frustration one day at the salon and I was talking with a client of mine and the client recommended and highly suggested that I actually send a message to my local congressperson. A gentleman by the name of Chris Chicola was in office at the time. And so I sent him a message and said, hey, we're one of your constituents and we actually have a pending 501c3. Is there anything that you can do? Well, he assigned us a liaison with the state office. And then that liaison was in constant contact with the IRS. And so, you know, they were working on our behalf. And it ended up that because of all of those things, even when they told us that it would be two years, it was six months. And we got our nonprofit status approved and that was 16 years ago. And so I was so grateful. I, you know, what I, what I tell people all the time, I think is you have to keep talking about it because you just don't know who knows who, and it really is a who knows who kind of thing. And so the more that you talk about it, the more that you get it out there, the more that people hear those words and the more that you can get guidance because you don't know what you don't know. I had no, I was a hairdresser. My, my late husband had a degree from Purdue in pre-Columbian archaeology. We didn't know what we were doing. And so, you know, we really needed to step in there. We needed to find people that could help guide us. And we found some amazing individuals that guide us, that set us up for success. Awesome. So and if I were to boil that down, it sounds like, hey, one is I like that, hey, we don't have this amount of time. What are our other options? And we're not going to just accept you have to wait as, as an answer now. Sometimes you do have to wait. Sometimes the government's just slow and there isn't an option. But I think that exhausting all of those options can oftentimes make the difference between being successful and getting up and going versus not or not working out because you're waiting, you know, you're waiting too long. Um, but then it sounds like, you know, one of the ways that you guys found that's helpful and maybe for others that are waiting and having to say, being told the same thing, they're having to wait for two years or however or a period of time is to reach out to your congressman or other people that can help to liaison otherwise or facilitate that, that, uh, that process and make it more expedited and quicker. Um, and I like the last one sounds like, you know, answering each question on a separate page so that it doesn't get mixed up. They don't, they can or focus on just that one question can sometimes uh, more clearly laid out. So I think those are all definitely uh, great takeaways. Now, shifting gears just slightly, but along the same lines, and it's kind of almost goes back to the original question, which is one of the things we talked about is, you know, you can start your own nonprofit. Sometimes it's just as good or maybe even better to go and partner with a nonprofit if you're a for-profit business rather than starting a nonprofit from scratch because you can get a lot of the same benefits. You can get a lot of the, the same um boost to, you know, your business or accomplishing the mission without having to go through all uh, running and uh, starting and running your own nonprofit. So kind of help us or help us understand, you know, if you're looking and saying, hey, I can either start a nonprofit with this mission or I can go partner with them. What are kind of some of the factors uh, you might consider? So, you know, I'm a big proponent of corporate social responsibility. I think that every business really should be giving back to a nonprofit in their community. That's one of the ways that, that they, you know, they may have a very successful, lucrative business and then showing that this is what they're doing to actually help their community to be a viable um, participating uh, participant, I guess, in that community is something that I really believe in. But what we found is, is that it's twofold. So um, years ago, we uh, Subway partnered with us. So Subway actually contacted us and said, hey, this is what we want to do for you. We've got this amazing cookie. 
And for every cookie that we sell, we're going to give you 25 cents out of this cookie. And um, it's going to be, we're going to donate X amount of dollars up to $7,000. And so we're like, oh my gosh, this was great. So they ran advertisements and they, so for a nonprofit, it's like, awesome. We are connected with a national brand, right? And so this national brand is talking about Hello Gorgeous, which was awesome, which made that national brand look really good because it's look at us. Here's what we're doing. We're helping a nonprofit organization that helps women with cancer, right? So it made that for-profit business look good. For the nonprofit, it was awesome because now we are connected with a local or a you know national brand that everybody's aware of. But we are then in turn talking about that national brand. We're telling people, hey, go buy a cookie. Because if you buy a cookie, you're helping us help more women with cancer. And so mm. all the way around, I think it's just a win-win. I think that, you know, we have a salon affiliate program. We go in and we train salons how to create the Hello Gorgeous experience. And my goal is to put 40,000 salon affiliates throughout the United States. And if anybody has ever visited a hair salon, it looks as if that there's a hair salon on every corner, right? Any city that you go into, they're all the same. You could have three hair salons in the same block. And when you look at it, it's like, what's the difference between those hair salons? They all offer haircuts. They all offer color. They all offer, you know, whatever it is. But when that salon applies to become a part of the Hello Gorgeous family, all of a sudden that elevates them. That makes them look different. It, it shows the compassion in the heart that they have for women battling cancer. And it's mm -hmm. an impact that they're making in their community. So amongst all of that competition, this one salon is able to say, hey, look, we're standing out. And you know what? People want to support people that are helping other people. And so I really believe that corporate social responsibility is a big thing. And for profit businesses, it is a way for them to get the edge on some of their competition. Now, one of the questions I've always had, and I, I think that's a, a great uh, way to think about it, is, you know, sometimes you do, you help other people, whether it's a, an individual or, you know, or a nonprofit or charity, sometimes it's out of the goodness of your heart and you don't want to, you know, you want to do it anonymously. You don't want to pe let people know. And other times you want to, you know, you see other people blasting it out to the world, letting everybody know, you know, sometimes it can almost, it feels like turn people off. In other words, saying, Hey, they're not really doing it because they want to help a cause. They just want to, you know, make more money or look like they're being charitable. And do you ever, do you ever get that? Or do you ever, any thoughts on how you're dealing with that as a business? I mean, in the one sense you're saying, Hey, if we're spending money on it, even if we're supporting a good cause, not, I don't think it's bad or wrong for business to say we also want to get some PR or good press or be able to increase the, our reach for the business while still helping and doing a good cause. But how do you balance that so you don't come across as, hey, we're just trying to look like we're being charitable to take advantage and to make, or, you know, to make ourselves look good? Does that make sense? It does. And I think that it's more about when, you know, um, most businesses will look at it as what's in it for me. Right. And so when you're mm -hmm. focused inward and when you help that nonprofit and that's all you're worried about is what's in it for me, you'll never you'll never be successful. But when you look at it as how can I use my influence to make an impact on that nonprofit, you're then focusing outward. And when you focus outward, it automatically comes back around inward. So I really think that that's what it is. I think that when you're focused on yourself as a business, people can see right through that. You know, you're only doing that for the PR, but when you're focused completely on, hey, this is a great mission. This is what we're going to be able to do to actually impact this mission. We're going to be able to help X amount of women by partnering with Hello Gorgeous. I think that people can see through that. So I would, as a rule, I always say, you know, it's not what's in it for you. It's what can you do for somebody else? And then it automatically comes back around as to what you're doing for them. Mm. Makes perfect sense. So now as we've kind of gone through that, if you were to take a step back and say, okay, nonprofits, or I guess one of the, or nonprofits, one of the other things that you've been kind of adding to that is an affiliate program. So help us understand the difference between maybe it's the same thing, partnering with a nonprofit, is that you just simply donate to them or what's an affiliate program or kind of if you decide, okay, I'm a for-profit business, I'm going to stay a for-profit business, but I still want to go give it to charity. I want to, it fits well with our mission, fits well with what we're trying to do. Maybe it helps our business and and, and it gives us a competitive edge. All of those things. What are the different ways that you can partner with, uh, with nonprofits? 
So what we do with our affiliate program, and I'll, I'll just start there and then kind of work out from there. So with our affiliate program, it's salons that come on board and we train them. And then what they do is they actually commit to doing one makeover a month. So it's, it's a commitment, right? So they're actually taking a woman from the community that has cancer. They're doing a full makeover on her and they're doing a big reveal for her. And that's their impact. That's what they're doing. So they're a partner more so than just a contributor because they're in it with us. They're actually providing the services. You know, they're, they're making an impact on that way. Hands-on. If mm. you were just a business and you wanted to just say that you wanted to help or contribute to a nonprofit, there's many ways that you could do that. If you wanted to just run a jean day, you know, that you say anybody that wants to wear blue jeans today, you donate $5 and you know, this is what we're going to, we're going to take it. We're going to choose a charity and then we're going to donate it. We have a local um, business, a very large business. I'm close to the RV industry in my area. And so they supply the RV industry with things that they need. And their goal is to give back a hundred thousand hours to the community. And so what they do is they actually pay their employees to find nonprofits to go and volunteer for. So that's another, so they may not actually donate dollars, Although they do, they sponsor a lot of events. So they do that as well. But it's more about having their people go into the community and actually be hands-on. But it's an ongoing process. But your employees are only there like for two or three hours, depending on what it is. So mm -hmm. you could plan a big event of some sort one time and just simply raise funds to donate to that nonprofit. Um, you could do a food drive at, at you know Thanksgiving time. You could do a sock drive. You know, You may not know this. But the one thing that homeless people want more than anything else are socks. That's what they can't find. And they, you know, you don't go to a thrift store and buy used socks. Nobody likes that. And so you could do a sock drive. You know, everybody that brings in a pair of socks, you know, it, things like that. I think that for the most part, people want to help. They just don't know how. So it just matters of what, you know, what you want to do. If you want to be a true partner, then that to me is like an annual thing that goes on monthly that you've made a commitment to. If you just want to be able to help a nonprofit, it might be a one-time event where either you make a large donation, you sponsor an event, or you do some sort of a drive. We're actually collecting items for that nonprofit. Um, and then that that's the way that you can impact a couple different ways. No, makes uh, makes perfect uh, perfect sense. And I did actually know, just as a complete aside, that that was one of the things that homeless people needed. And the reason it is, and I'll, I'll I guess I'll tout it out, but it's really something we do more anonymously. One of the things I love to do, both with my wife and my kids, is we at the beginning of each month we sit down as a family, and each one, both my wife, my kids, each of us individually, will donate ever however much we made. Just. I don't care. I told my kids, I don't care if it's a penny, a dollar, or if they decide they don't want to donate at all. And we'll do the same, my wife and I, and we'll put it into what we call homeless bags. And what basically is, is we'll put it into bags that will have toothbrushes, it will have socks, it will have gift cards to like uh, McDonald's and other things that they'll use. And the reason it got started is we were looking and saying, I don't like to give money to homeless people because I don't know how it's going to be used. It may be used for great purposes. It may be used for alcohol, which I don't agree with, or other drugs. And I just don't want to get into that. But I still want to be able to give and be charitable. And so we just said, hey, what's the way we can do that? And so we decided, hey, we're going to give nice bags that they will give us, Eric, have some of them, some things that they will need. And we found out the same way is that their socks is one of the things that they need. So I think that that uh, just as a complete aside, I did know that that or did know that that was one thing they need just because of what we've done. But no, I think that going back to what you or what you hit on, I think there's a lot of different ways that you can partner with nonprofits, whether it's an affiliate program, whether it's just simply donating some of the proceeds to X, Y, and Z. Or as you mentioned, you know, businesses or companies that sponsor, otherwise give employees time to participate or do things with nonprofits. I think there's a lot of great ways. And I think both is a is beneficial to the business, helpful to the culture. It can be a great, you know, marketing or PR or angle, and it helps a lot of great causes. So I think that's a lot of great information. So well, with that, we're already at the end of the uh, episode, and it seems like there's a whole bunch of more things we could talk about, and so we'll have to have you on again sometime. Um, but for today's episode, um, if, you, if as we wrap up, I always have one question I ask at the end of each episode, so we'll jump to that now, um, which is, within your industry, what is the biggest myth, and why is it wrong? You know, I think the biggest myth is that people think that every person that's diagnosed with cancer automatically loses their hair. Mm. And I also think that people think just because you go through cancer treatment and you don't lose your hair, that your cancer isn't as viable as the person that did lose their hair. It's just a matter of a treatment. You know, when I um, was diagnosed with cancer three years ago, um, mine was just simply taken care of by a surgery. Thank goodness I didn't have to go through chemo or radiation. 
but it doesn't make me any less um, fearful. It doesn't make, it didn't make my cancer any less viable because I didn't have to go through that. I still heard the words you have cancer. And so I think mm -hmm. that people automatically think we hear the word cancer. It's a death sentence. I'm going to lose my hair. That's all there is to it. And that's not it. Cancer isn't a death sentence anymore. And every treatment doesn't make you lose your hair. And so I think that those are the two things that, that people just don't get. And, and so that being said, if you've ever heard the word you have cancer, if you have a family member, just be compassionate, no matter what it is they're going through, because there's still mental duress to the fact that you heard those words. No, oh, and I think that's a, a definitely a fair takeaway. And, you know, I, it's probably partially because you watch the TV shows or watch the movie and everybody always loses their hair and that, you know, usually it's, the, you know, the movies or the TV show, they they throw up, they get sick and they lose their hair. And I think that that's a great myth to dispel because I think there's a lot of different different cancers, different treatments, different options. And yet it's all, whether or not you lose your hair, you get the sickness, or, you know, you get sick as you do the treatments or not, you shouldn't, it doesn't minimize the difficulty and the or, or things that you're having to go through and deal with. And I think we should always be understanding and respectful and also be supportive of that in any way we can. So I think that's a great uh, myth to dispel. Well, as we wrap up, if people want to reach out to you, they want to be a customer, they want to be a client, they want to donate to your charity, they want to be an employee, they want to be a volunteer, they want to be your next best friend, any or all of the above, what's the best way to reach out to you, contact you, find out more? So our website is hellogorgeous.org. There's all kinds of information, free resources. We've got books available. We have an online membership site. So lots of different things to support women with cancer. If people want to reach me directly, they can email me at kbecker at hellogorgeous.org. Awesome. Well, I definitely encourage people to reach out and connect all the way, all the ways that you provided and any other way that's available um, to support a great cause and to support a great nonprofit. Um, and with that, thank you again, Kim, for coming on the podcast. It's been a fun. It's been a pleasure. Um, now for all of you that are out there um, to help us to share all this expertise and to make sure that we can help as many startups and small businesses as we can, please make sure to click share, subscribe, and leave us a review. Helps us to reach all those our startups and then share this great expertise. And with that, if you ever need help with your patents, your trademarks, or anything else with your startup, or your small business, just go to strategymeeting.com, grab some time with us to chat, and we're always here to help. Well, thank you again, Kim, for coming on and wish the next leg of your journey even better than the last. Thank you. Have a great day, Devin.